Tarrant County. I just bought all your land records online. <laughs> so, um, uh, so what Julie didn't tell you is I asked her to get Mary Louise uh, and Mike up here to just kind of stall and need as much time as I could out of my deal because I actually have to come up with something profitable and fruitful to, to talk to you all about. Just to kind of give you an outline, I, I want to talk to you about a couple things. I want to give you a little bit more of my background and, and I don't say that to talk to you about who I am as much to talk to you about kind of the story that brings us all, I think, to this room because I think the way we all ended up uh, fighting this battle is, is pretty similar. And then I want to talk to you about where Texas is, and then I want to talk to you about things that you can do right now to begin to help move our state in the right direction. So, um, I, I have a quote that I wanted to kind of share with y'all to kick things off. It's a quote that I, I learned about a year and a half ago, and uh, it's really kind of stuck with me. Um, Abraham Kuyper was the Prime Minister of the Netherlands in the early 1900s, 1901 to 1905. He was a pastor before that, and he served in other political roles. Um, but he was elected as the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, and he had an interesting quote. And the reason I think it's interesting is because it was in the Netherlands, and it was in the early 1900s. And so many of us have that perspective, I think, um, of you know, the good old days, way back when, and uh, oh, 20 years ago we were doing well, and it seems like today sometimes we're losing the fight. But at the end of the day, the battle that we engage with, and the battle that we're in today, is a battle of ideas, philosophies and a political worldview, but that battle has always existed and it's always been there. So nothing is, is worse, I think, off or, or better off today, but I'll talk about that a little bit. Abraham Kuyper said this, when principles that run against your deepest convictions begin to win the day, then battle is your calling and peace has become sin. When principles that run against your deepest convictions begin to win the day, then battle is your calling and peace has become sin. If you had asked me what I was going to do with the rest of my life in 2005, I would have told you I was going to be a doctor because I was named after Luke in the Bible and uh, he was a doctor. And so I just kind of figured that was the calling that, that had been placed on my life. A um, couple things happened my sophomore year in high school. One, I, I failed chemistry. And, uh, and so that was one indicator that that was maybe not the direction that I was supposed to be going in. But the other one was that my dad was approached by several community leaders, one main one, and asked to consider running for state representative. And uh, we, we were not politically engaged at the time. Uh, I, I listened to Rush Limbaugh growing up. I watched presidential debates. I watched the State of the Union every year with my siblings and my mom and dad would get in. We'd watch it and then my mom would always correct whatever they said on there and kind of talk to us about what was really going on. Um, the first political conversation I remember with my mom was actually during George W. Bush and Al Gore's elections. And we were driving and we were listening to reports about it. And I said, Mom, you know, what are, what are we doing in these elections? And she said, Luke, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Um, I am praying that George W. Bush gets elected. I fear that our country deserves Al Gore. And that was the first thing I ever heard um, regarding politics that I remember. So I'm blessed with great parents that really instilled that into me. Um, my dad did decide to run for state representative against Carter Castile, who was one of the most liberal Republicans in the Texas House at the time. Um, she had Democrats that were more conservative than her in the chamber. We ran a 90-day campaign. We had no idea what we were doing. We'd never been to a Republican function. We'd never gone out and entered a club or made a speech or anything, but we knocked on 10,000 doors and we got elected. There were 20,000 votes cast in that election, and my dad got elected by 45 votes. Wow. So I learned from an early age that every single vote matters. Um, I knew at that point that this was something that I was passionate about, that the Lord had given me a passion for. And so I went to Austin with my dad. It's illegal for him to pay me, which um, you know I think he actually really liked that it was illegal for him to, to pay me. So he said he gets to come up and work for me for free, so I did. Um, he was ranked as one of the top conservatives in the state, up there with Bill Zedler and Ken Paxton and Wayne Christian and all those guys. But there were a couple people that weren't very happy with his performance. And uh, the teacher unions being the main group, the casino gambling interests who wanted to expand gaming in, in Texas, they picked three state representatives at the time and spent half a million dollars against each of them in 2008. And then a couple of moderate establishment Republicans locally. They spent nearly a million dollars against us in our re-election campaign. There were 30,000 votes cast and we lost by 17. Oh. And so again, uh, if you don't think the Lord has a hand in the election results, you'll probably go mad at some of these election results. But, um, but that happened in 2008. But I knew at that point that, that I wanted to be engaged and I, and I just kind of took whatever opportunity. This is when Tarrant County came into play. 
Because my dad and I still went to the state convention and he said, I'm not going to exit politics. I'm not going to stop getting involved. I'm going to stay involved. I'm going to stay engaged. We reached out to one of our politically connected friends in 2008 in the fall. And I said, hey, the fall elections are coming up. And I want to know which state house races are important right now. And uh, I've got some friends. Maybe we'll help out a little bit. And the guy who's my state rep is a crook because um, he replaced my dad. You know, of course he's going to be that. Um, so he gave me a list of four people. And there was only one person I knew, Bill Zettel, who was actually up for re-election here in Arlington. At the time, he was kind of the one really principled conservative we had in Tarrant County. So my dad and I talked. And I said, OK, we're going to go help Bill Zettler. So starting six weeks out from the election, a friend of mine and I, I went to one of the guys I worked with at the time. I was working for a higher education company. And I said, OK, here's the deal. We got this guy in Arlington. Block walking starts at 10. We got to get up at 4.30. We're going to drive there five hours. We're going to block walk all day. And then we're going to drive back same day. And for some reason, he thought that was a really good idea, too. <laughs> and so I convinced my sisters. And we all got in the car, five of us. We drove up. I don't know how we lived, but we did it. We block walked a full day, we came back, and then we started doing that every weekend. Now the problem was I would lose friends every weekend. So I'd have to go to a new group of friends and be like, there's this really cool thing. Here's the thing, wake up at 4.30, drive up to Arlington, we're all gonna block walk, we drive back, they're like, oh, I've never campaigned, okay? And so they all get in a car and they're tired, and they come back, and then the next weekend, like I couldn't even get to their desk. Hey, oh, never mind, okay, next weekend. Have you gone? Let's go. And so four or five of us, we did that for six weeks in a row, every single time. We probably knocked on a couple thousand doors each weekend. Uh, I took a week of vacation and came up here and sat polls in Arlington with Bill Zettler every single day. We both got there at 7 a.m. We left to 7 p.m. I went to Starbucks. I got his little Pikes coffee there. And then I went to a little smoothie shop and got a smoothie midday. And we, I got like 19 shades darker um, uh, during early voting. And it was interesting in 2008 because there was a wave election for Democrats. Y'all probably remember, but Bill Zettler actually lost his re-election campaign that year. There was another politician that was standing polls with us every single day, up and coming in Tarrant County, that was Wendy Davis. Um, and so we stood polls every single day, Wendy and Chris Turner and Bill Zettler, myself and about four or five others, and we just worked every single voter we could. But that was my first introduction to Tarrant County. Luckily, Bill ran two years later and got elected and, and we were good to go. Um, but I worked in 2010 with Ken Mercer, who's on the State Board of Education. He's one of the conservatives who's actually fighting to maintain some sort of standards in the curriculum that's actually taught to the students in public school. I was homeschooled, but the vast majority of the students in the state are educated in a public education system. And if you don't think the left is out to change what their perception is of America, then just go read any type of public education textbook. So Ken Mercer was leading the fight on that issue. He was my State Board of Education member. And these are the type of encouraging things that I like sharing, because he was running for re-election, and he had done what he said he was going to do. And that's all he took to the voters. We went back to the voters and said, I told you I was going to fight for your textbooks. I fought for your textbooks. We only had $35,000. We were running in two congressional districts. Our district was twice, it was bigger than every single state east of the Mississippi. Our opponent spent $170,000 against us. And Ken Mercer got reelected with 71% of the vote. And so that was in 2010. And he came back. And then in 2011, I worked in the legislature. 2012, I ended up coming up and working with quite a few people here in Tarrant County. Uh, Matt Krause, Giovanni Capriglione, Jonathan Stickland, who all got elected there in 2012, and that was awesome. In the last 2014 elections, we got to work with people like Tony Tinderholt, people like Connie Burton, people like Bob Hall, Matt Rinaldi. Now I'm down there fighting for us. And this is what I kind of want to shift into, because that's my story and kind of what brings me here. Um, those are some of the people that I end up working with. Um, but the truth is that it was... Ten years ago that, that I had no more than listening to Rush Limbaugh, my dad had done no more. He actually uh, helps disciple young people in the political system now and does all sorts of things like that. But I think a lot of us in this room ten years ago weren't engaged at all. And when my dad got to the Texas House of Representatives, there was no conservative coalition. There was no Tea Party. There were no people that were trying to reform this. It was a handful of legislators, six, five or six people that used to hang out with my dad and Ken Paxton and Bill Zedler and Wayne Christian and that group. And so to recognize where we've come, I do have a perspective. When I look at where we currently are in the state of Texas, I'm pretty encouraged because we have made huge strides. In 2008, when I was standing there with polls and shaking hands, trying to get people to reelect Bill Zedler, you know, when we lost Bill, we didn't have conservatives in Tarrant County that were representing our conservative values. And today, 
it's hard to find a Republican that's not conservative other than Charlie Guerin. So, I mean, it's, it's moving our state dramatically in the right direction. But Tarrant County is really at the center of all of that. That's exciting. But let's talk about where we are as a state. So where we are as a state is positive in some ways and negative in others. So it's positive in some ways in that we have more conservative representation than the state of Texas ever has, ever has. The Texas Senate is, I'm talking four to five to six, I don't know, 10 times more conservative than it ever has been. And that is due to a lot of the hard work that people here have put in when it comes to electing conservatives like Connie Burton, who's now ranked as the most conservative senator in Texas. Put that in perspective. Wendy Davis, Wendy Davis to the most conservative senator in the state of Texas. Bob Hall, who defeated Bob Dole. Don Huffines, who defeated John Corona. Two Republican incumbents losing their elections. <clears throat> when it comes to the Texas House and the amount of conservatives that we've had come in, it's tremendous. I was just talking to Mike about a bill even last session. Last session we had a bill, the Lilly Ledbetter Law, which is really just kind of a frivolous lawsuit, trial lawyer's best dream in, in Texas. And it passed the Texas House and passed the Texas Senate last session. And then Governor Perry was kind enough to veto the legislation. Um, this session, it died in the Senate, didn't even get a hearing, it came to the House and uh, two-thirds of the House voted it down. There's definitely a shift when it comes to people's perspectives, and that also has to do with all the pressure and the things that y'all keep doing. But that's the good part. So I want to talk about, now let's talk about the bad part. The bad part comes down to this, and you're gonna have a lot of people come back and talk about Texas. Senators, legislators, you're gonna hear a lot of people post on their Facebook and see stuff like that. And here's how I differentiate politicians from public servants, okay? And the biggest difference. Politicians will only talk to you about how good things are, okay? So all their reports are just so dang positive. And the public service will usually tell you about all the things that they're not doing that they could do better, right? Here's what we're not doing, especially in Texas. And I'm going to give you an example. Everyone likes to say that Texas is leading the way, right? Texas is leading the way. As goes Texas, so goes the rest of the nation. Well, we're actually really lucky that that's not the case. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of, of how that works. So legislators come back and they say, hey, we're all good to go. I'm kind of reminded of a conversation I remember Bill Zettler had with a couple people. Last, um, this was in 2011. We didn't really balance the budget. We had $7 billion of accounting gimmicks. And a bunch of the Republicans were talking about it. And they said, hey, when you say we balance the budget without raising taxes, you know, so I'm getting all this blowback from people because they're saying, no, you didn't. You actually underfunded certain funds intentionally to try to make it balance. And, and what are our talking points to get around that? And they started giving them. And Bill just, he was in this group of legislators, he said, well, why don't you just tell them we didn't balance the budget? Because that's what I tell them, and they all love them. Like, I just say, we didn't balance the budget. We have $7 billion of accounting gimmicks. We probably shouldn't use accounting gimmicks in the future. But a politician can't help them. They can't help themselves, right? Because they voted for the budget. So they can't tell you they have accounting gimmicks in it. And so they're going to always paint a very rosy picture. But when it comes to all the policy issues, Texas is not leading the way. So let's take them one by one. Guns, as an example. So the good news is, open carry has passed both the Senate and the House. There's a little bit of back and forth on whether that will actually become law. It would be a very good thing if it did. But let's put this in perspective, okay? The state of Texas is not following when it comes to guns. It's not even, it's not leading, it's not following. We are lagging. We are lagging way behind when it comes to gun legislation. We have to recognize the fact that six states currently allow any citizen to carry a firearm as a, as a law-abiding citizen, and two are about to open it up to any citizen. Currently, the only person who can carry a firearm in the state of Texas is a CHL user. After all this laws pass, the only citizen who can carry a gun in Texas is a CHL user, okay? And when Jonathan Sticklin and Matt Rinaldi and several conservatives just made an effort to say, let's have a vote on an amendment that will strengthen the gun laws in Texas, they were told, you're not even allowed to offer that amendment. This isn't even, this isn't even in consideration. And on the Senate side, too, there was never even a vote on this type of legislation. Now, think of it this way. We have legislators who are out there posting on Facebook, we passed open carry, we're moving forward, we're doing this, Texas is leading the way. When South Carolina just passed a law with a supermajority in its Senate and House is now waiting the signature of the governor, which says that any law-abiding citizen can walk into a store, purchase a gun, put it on their hip, and walk out. And Texas's massive, game-changing, leading-the-way gun legislation is if you're a CHL user, you can 
move this. That's somehow just leading the way for the state of Texas. And then the liberals come out and they say, well, guys, it, Texas just isn't ready for that. Well, Vermont has been ready for that since its inception, and it re-elected Barack Obama as president. Since its inception, Vermont has had constitutional carry. And Howard Dean is still alive. So we know <laughs> that right-wing radicals are not about to go out and shoot people. It's just, it's evidence. The science points to it. It's fine. We're not leading. We're not even following. We're lagging when it comes to guns. Let's talk about union reforms. So there's a lot of discussion in the Senate. You've probably seen a lot of stuff going around lately. We've passed Senate Bill 1968 out of the Senate, which is going to say that local public governments, both cities, counties, and state organizations, cannot contract with public employee unions to automatically withdraw money from public employees' paychecks. Okay. So, if I'm a public employee, I cannot get money automatically drafted. And you say, well, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, let's talk about a couple of things. The American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees is a federal PAC, which automatically can bring dues and then also can do PAC donations. That PAC gives 99% of its political donations in Texas are to Democrats. These are reforms that have passed in Illinois, Kansas, and Wisconsin. Okay, now think of that. Now, hopefully, this legislation will pass. We don't know. The same bill was filed in the House. It was actually referred to a committee that a Democrat chairs, so I doubt that he's going to hear that bill. But there is a chance that this Senate bill could get referred to another committee. Maybe we'll pass it. And you'll probably have a bunch of politicians that get up and say, we're leading the way on union reform. No, we're following Illinois when it comes to union reform, okay? Texas isn't leading. It's not even following. It's lagging. Now, hopefully, we can get this conservative policy passed. We shouldn't be patting ourselves on the back saying we're leading the way when we're not, when it comes to union. Let's talk about education. It was interesting, the only thing we've done in education so far is actually expand education and the role it plays on young children. And uh, if y'all haven't seen kind of more, more descriptions of what the pre-K program does, which Governor Abbott has, has really advanced, you should read up on it, you should understand it. Uh, there's even sections in that bill which actually provide provisions for the government to be reaching out and informing families upon the birth of their children on the benefits to education. So, um, you know, it's interesting. Barack Obama came out in the State of the Union address and said, guys, we want to pay for your community college, right? We want to pay for your community college. We all remember that. And my dad told me, basically, we've now made 13th and 14th grade, okay? So we're going to just take care of your kids for two more years. Which, by the way, kids used to stop around 14 years of age before high school even existed. If you, I mean, high school was actually not around. You just finished eighth grade and went straight to college, but that's okay. So now we're going to have 13th and 14th grade. And in Texas, we said, okay, Obama, if you're going to cover 13th and 14th grade, we'll just add a year on earlier. So, so we're going to team up and we're going to successfully create more government control for three more years of your children's lives. And let's see where that's getting us. Now, the education reforms, which hopefully will pass this session, are real small things like A to F grading of school districts or schools. Instead of failing or not failing, you can say from an A to an F, how is this school performing? But the funny thing is, when we, have, when we have hearings on these things and we start talking about these things, all the people coming to testify are from other states that have implemented these things. Florida. Florida's done all sorts of education reform. And they're sitting there saying, here's what A to F school system ratings looks like. Here's what public choice looks like. Here's what expanding charter funding looks like. So Texas isn't leading when it comes to education reform. We're following. We're not even really following. We're lagging. We're lagging behind. And you have people voting for pre-K saying, hey, we have science that shows that it helps children in underprivileged families actually do better in school. Well, you know what helps children in underprivileged areas out of public school is getting them more school choice and actually giving them options to get out of there. I work in an after school program in downtown San Antonio and I work with first graders and fourth graders that are on the exact same level when it comes to their understanding of multiplication and reading. I doubt if you stick that child into a pre-k program they're going to be better prepared because evidently what they're getting for the first through fourth is not high quality education. So why aren't we addressing that? Texas isn't leading, it's following, it's not following, it's lagging. Religious liberty. There's a lot to be said in the news lately about religious liberty. But at the end of the day, there are seven states that have religious liberty protections. And we are about to potentially enter a time in our country 
which we've never entered, which people are actually, it's actually being called into question whether or not people of faith can practice their faith. This doesn't have to do with harming another individual. This doesn't have to do with, with trying to, to refuse anything to somebody. This has to do with me practicing my faith. Do you realize that, that Scalia said in the arguments when it came to the same-sex marriage potential overruling that he asked the question, are we actually going to force a pastor to perform a gay wedding if we overturn this? Because interpretations could say that we're supposed to do that. Now, there are seven states in the United States of America that protect, that have codified constitutional protections in their constitution that protect more solidly the religious liberties of individuals, all individuals of their state. Now, what y'all probably don't know, which you should, because it's a client of mine, so I'm going to give a, a kind of self as well, is Matt Krause has filed that same legislation the last two sessions. So, we, and, and, and there was another representative that filed the last session too, Jason Eisen. It was filed last session, it had a hearing, it died in the State Affairs Committee. This session, Jason Vialba, um, a Democrat <laughs> from, from Dallas, um, who I, he says he's a Republican, but truthfully, he's, he's a Democrat. He voted for the minimum wage the other day, increasing the minimum wage. Um, he filed the legislation and said, we're going to increase religious liberty in Texas. And a week before the filing deadline for bills, the Texas Association of Business came out and said, we oppose bigotry, and we oppose Jason Vialba's legislation. And all this was going to do was increase the religious liberty protections of the people of Texas. And Jason dropped the bill. Matt Krause, because he's a champion and a patriot, took the legislation, filed it, and has been trying to work it through. It got assigned to the State Affairs Committee, hasn't gotten a hearing, and we have 20 days left, so it's a dead, dead bill. Now, when we have states like Kansas, Kentucky, and Indiana passing these things, and we can't get a hearing on the bills, Texas isn't leading when it comes to protecting your religious liberty. We're following, and we're not really following, we're failing. And so, we have a bill, hopefully this, this week that will get heard in the Texas House regarding the religious liberty of pastors to basically say pastors cannot be forced to perform a wedding which they do not condone, which I think pastors should have the ability to refuse to perform any wedding ceremony, regardless of who it is, both man and woman or man and man or woman and woman. But the reality is that we're about to pass that when other states have said everybody's protected. If you, if you bake cakes, you get to decide if you want to participate in that ceremony or not. Texas is just going to limit it to pastors, and then hopefully we can expand it to others. But if anybody comes here and says we're leading, we're not leading. We're lagging. And so that's really the perspective of where Texas is. Texas is in a great place because we are stronger. We have more conservative legislators and ability to kill bad bills and pass more good bills than we ever have before. Ever, I mean, since I have been alive, which is, you know, maybe a third of some of y'all. Um, <laughs> That wasn't bad. I'm not saying. I'm not gonna say who. <laughs> but where we also are is that we're not leading, and that's really what the 2016 elections come down to, and that's what we're asking from our legislators. So what can we do? Let's talk about a couple things we can do real quick, and then we'll open it up for questions. Hopefully, I haven't taken too much time. What can we do? First of all, we've got to support the people that are actually doing the work as our elected officials. And that goes for local people who are putting all of our property online so I can buy it all. <laughs> and cutting their budgets and doing all those things. That comes to local officials who are performing, slashing government, cutting waste, and actually being with, living within their budget, which is very hard to find on a local level. So, Mary Louise, you're doing an awesome job. It comes to state elected officials who are actually up there. You have to realize, Everyone here is making a sacrifice. Y'all are making a sacrifice when you show up to help these people, and the elected officials are making a sacrifice when they decide to run. I'm the only one who's probably not sacrificing much. I'm just kind of here. Um, but they're all making that sacrifice, and they deserve your support in every single way. They need your encouragement when it comes to the tough votes they're casting. They need your support when they come back and they get tough re-election campaigns. And I say that from personal experience, because my dad came back and he had seven kids at home. He had to go back to work. and his opponent was already out knocking on doors against him. And he's like, well, I literally need to feed my children, so I'm sorry, this is a, a part-time gig for me. Support them. The way I would determine, if I had to say, what's the strong list of people, because everyone has limited amounts of time, talent, and treasure, I would, I would narrow it down to the 19 people that voted against Joe Strauss for, for speaker. And the reason I would do that is not about Strauss, actually. It's about a mindset of what Texas needs. 
The people who voted against Strauss, it's not about one person. It's about a perspective that Texas has to actually step up and lead, and it's not happening. And so those 19 people deserve all of your support in a very strong way. The other way I would do it in the other chamber is I would actually look at the pre-K vote, because that's an example of voting against your party and people who said, you know, we, we, all, of the, all of the education reform, by the way, has passed the Texas Senate. Very strong education reform passed the Texas Senate. Most of it's going to die in the Texas House. Only the A through F rating is probably going to pass both chambers. So the, the Republicans that voted against pre-K in the Senate deserve your strong consideration. You need to go out and help them. You need to talk to your friends about it. I'm going to give you some specific ways to do that. Um, Troy Frazier, by the way, is another senator who voted against pre-K. He's like really liberal. He's just really scared of conservatives who are going to come after him this next election cycle. So don't help him. And just don't <laughs> that. One vote does not make. The guy's been elected since like 1940, and it's like he just took his first good vote of his existence as an official. So, um, so I want to talk to you about how to help in a specific way, okay? And I want to kind of incorporate this into a second point. So you have to help them. That's the first point. The second point, which is going to go on with the first point, is I want us to actually work on growing the team, okay? So I want to help the guys, but I want to grow the team. And here's what I mean by that. Many people, and we just had a, a candidate for Collegeville step up here, and, and I gave you my story, and I know most a lot of y'all's stories. But most of us six years ago were watching Fox News, listening to Rush Limbaugh, really scared about the direction of our country. But that doesn't mean we were actually doing anything, right? And so what I need you to work on, and what I'm working on, is trying to find those people and getting them engaged in very small ways. Going back to the Bill Zedler deal, so there was a young man who was working in, at College Plus, which was the higher education company I was working for at the time. And I had just heard him talk about politics before. So I went to him and I said, you like politics? He said, yeah. I said, OK. Tomorrow morning, 4.30 a.m., we're going to drive up. He said, awesome. He ended up coming every single weekend with me for four weekends. He then went back to Kentucky. He actually ran for county chair in Kentucky. He started getting them involved. He actually increased the Republican turnout in that Democrat county by 10%. He helped elect Rand Paul against Trey Grayson, who was the establishment who ran there. He then came down to Texas and worked on Donna Campbell's campaign, who unseated the last pro-choice Republican senator in Texas. He then worked for me. He then worked for Jonathan Sticklin last legislative session. He then came back and worked for me, and now he's Tony Tinderhall's chief of staff. And that's somebody who, when I went to him in 2008, was simply listening to Rush Limbaugh, cared about his country, scared, and many of y'all were in the same place. So here's how, a couple ways I want you to think about growing the team, but you can do it however you want. So there's two specific ways. I think people either are going to get engaged one way, either with their time and talent or their treasure. So I'm going to give you two examples. So one example would be the idea of activism and then attending one of these meetings. So if this is your first meeting to attend, you need to come back and you bring more people. But you're going to get people engaged one of three ways. You're either going to get them to attend a meeting like this, right, where they're going to be here for the first time and they're going to realize, hey, maybe I can actually make a difference. You're going to maybe get them to donate to a candidate, or you're going to get them to give of their time. And so one of those things we want to try to do with several people, and I want you to think about who those people are, specifically target them, and get them engaged. So one would be getting them to this meeting, right? So you're going to go out and you're going to say, look, I'm going to this meeting tonight. You're coming with me. I will see you there. We will be there. And then I will try to get you to keep coming back, right? People you haven't seen here, you're going to grow the team. The other way I want you to do it is something this summer. And this is the donation. You know, most people you know have never given $25 to a candidate. They've complained, they've moaned, they've watched Fox News, they've listened to Rush Limbaugh, they do all sorts of stuff, but they've never actually done anything. They've never even sacrificed $25 to somebody who's making the sacrifice of actually being up there take, with blood, sweat, and tears getting shot at all the time taking the right votes. So I want you to think through those people and who they are. I want you to get four or five of them together. I want you to do something real simple. I want you to say, look, this summer, it's July, I'm going to put a little lunch together. And I'm going to have all five of you come here. I'm going to have Tony Tinderholt show up, or Jonathan Sicklin. Make sure they're a Messiah Strategies client before you, you know, go <laughs> them. I'm kidding. Uh, Sharon Wilson, too, which she doesn't pay me, so, you know, not a plug. Um, but I want you to, I'm going to, set up, I'm going to set up a lunch. And I want five of y'all to come, and I'm going to have you meet this person. And I'm going to have you talk to him, and I'm going to have you ask him questions, 
and I'm gonna tell you what he's done, and I'm gonna show you his voting record, and I'm gonna give him a little money, and I'm gonna ask every single one of you to give him a little money. I don't care if it's $10, $25, $50, $1,000, you know, rich people, bring them. But the whole point is, I want five people who have never done anything, personally, other than vote and listen to Rush Limbaugh, to actually do something, right? So you're gonna get five people, you're gonna get them there, you're gonna say, here's Tony, Talk to him. Tony was blown up twice. Who doesn't write a check to a guy blown up twice? I mean, you have to hate your country to do that. Even a Democrat would give him money. And so you're going to say, here's the guy. Meet him. Tell him your story. Tell him what you did. He cares about his country. 